Give thanks to the Lord. God bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness unto all generations. Let us worship God and begin with a hymn of praise. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. continue in prayer, I will begin with words of my own and invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you speak a word, and this green and gentle planet is set upon its faithful course. You consider your eternal purposes, and we are knit together in our mother's womb. Now with tulips and magnolia, we would give you glory. Now like migrating birds at Prince Edward Point, we would pause and no Sabbath rest in your promises. We've come together this morning with trust and joy to pray to you and to sing your praise. To lay before you the week past and the days ahead to listen with expectation for a living word in scripture and in sermon. Well, oh God, this morning we thank you especially for our families within this family of faith. We share so much of life with them, old and young. Even when they're far from us, we are bound close. When we're angry or frustrated, they can rescue us from ourselves. When we doubt, they can rekindle our faith. As we gather this morning, we thank you for laughter and conversations, for arguments and agreements, for routines and for special days. We thank you for every glimpse of your love in our life together. Of course, O oh God, before you we can do no other but also acknowledge that we've failed each other. we failed each other in small ways and large. We have failed each other occasionally and always. And so we pray may this hour be one in which we feel your healing touch upon us. 
body and soul, that we might know new beginnings by your grace and live more fully in your paths in our families and communities. May we truly believe that in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you have embraced all humanity and brought us into your great family of heaven and earth. Oh God, we pray this in the name of Jesus and we continue in the words he taught us together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is in the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of the congregation of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Kingston, Ontario, that I welcome you this morning. During this time of a continuing stay-at-home order, we thank God together that we are bound together by this Holy Spirit to become the living body of the living Lord. And I pray that this hour will be a blessing to you. The order of service is available on the church website. You can read it there or download it for printing. And there are several announcements included also. I would like to highlight that tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, an online fellowship time hosted by Marilyn Trudeau. And that next Sunday morning, after our service of worship, a congregational meeting to receive the report and recommendation of the Mance Review Task Group. This morning I'd like to thank those who are making this time possible. Larry, carrying in the Holy Scriptures, and Dorothy, preparing to read from them. Paul, leading us in songs of praise and John accompanying us through the hour. But there's one other I would especially mention this morning. There is one who uh, tomorrow is, I heard, celebrating a birthday. And so, Benjamin, our videographer, this pain au chocolat is for you but not until after the service. We continue now as we turn to God's Word. We call this day Sunday. It's a very old name for this day of the week. But after Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, the Christians gave the day a, a new name. They called it the Lord's Day. And now we remember how God came to us in Jesus and how he is the Lord of life. On this Lord's Day, on this particular Lord's Day, as Christians, we thank God for life in all its dimensions, but especially for our families. Life rarely unfolds as we expect or plan. It involves challenge and struggles, as well as growth and joy, as does our family life. This morning, Christian Family Sunday, we'll begin our reading of Holy Scripture with two brief psalms. The first reminds us that God's love is not just for me or even for us. It is steadfast unto the generations. And the second reading, another psalm, speaks of the intimacy with which we can know and serve God, an intimacy as close as a mother, as a child within the mother's womb. 
I invite you to read these two psalms with me responsively. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve God with gladness. Come and join God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God who made us, and to God we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and God's faithfulness to all generations. And continuing the Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother. My soul within, within me is, is like, like a weaned child. child. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time and on, on and, and forevermore. We continue now with two more lessons from Holy Scripture, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Both are scenes that encourage us to pay attention to the ways that God is present to us, God speaks to us beyond the sanctuary. In the one, through a bush burning and yet not consumed. And in the other, through the lilies of the field. I invite Dorothy to lead us in these. Let us pray. Lord God, may these words of Scripture touch our hearts and draw us close to you. Amen. Our first selection is from Exodus 3 with selected verses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, and see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites, out of Egypt. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Thanks be to God for this, his holy word.
Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found now acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In one of the chapters of her book, An Altar in the World, Barbara Brown Taylor introduces the person of Simone Weil. Simone Weil, a well-educated French Jew, belonged to a wealthy family and therefore was able to flee the Nazis, fleeing from France to England. But she decided to live as those, as those who struggled and so she chose. Though she could have been a teacher, she worked in a factory. Though she could have had eggs with butter, she ate canned food. Most of her No One Works were published only after her death. One of them, Waiting for God, published in 1950. In this book, she quotes a passage from the Upanishads, an ancient philosophical text that many say is an early source of the Hindu religion. And the image that's conjured up is of two winged companions, two birds, on branches of the same tree. One eats the fruit hanging from the branch, and the other just looks at it. They concludes, these two birds are two parts of the soul. Part of us wants to consume. Another part yearns to look. And she writes, it may be that vice, depravity, and crime are nearly always or even perhaps always in their essence attempts to eat beauty, to eat what we should only look at. For herself, it was this looking at that they focused upon. In the church, too. She had been raised a secular Jew, but she'd been drawn to the Christian faith, first by hearing hymns of a Portuguese congregation as they wandered through the streets singing on some high and holy day. And then, when she took up one of the poems of George Herbert, and read it through, she said she felt, quote, Christ himself come down and take possession of me. They experienced a deep desire to be baptized, but in the end, she declined. She declined because she could not seek her own soul's safety in a church that denied salvation to those who did not belong to it. She spent the rest of her short life, she died at age 34 in 1943. She spent the rest of her life without eating the bread or drinking the wine of Holy Communion. But she said looking at them was enough. For now she knew that in Christ, the Holy One did provide and always would provide. And in the meantime, she said, she would remain hungry with those who were hungry in her occupied land. Looking at. Looking at has been long neglected. We, for long, have been defined, allowed ourselves to be defined by what we eat and wear and own and what we accomplish in this culture of achievement and consumption. We have been even arranging our relationships according to our own personal desires and needs. Perhaps this pandemic is giving us an opportunity to reconsider our lives, our presumptions, our priorities. Perhaps looking again might become part of the Christian journey the spiritual journey of Christians. 
One morning this past week, I came across Sarah walking William on the sidewalk. Sarah had been listening to a podcast. It was of a professor at Yale, I think she told me, who was giving a series of lectures on um, different perspectives on happiness through the ages and the cultures and the religions. And it just so happened that this morning she was listening to a lecture on happiness as conveyed within the Torah. And in particular, happiness as known in the experience of Sabbath. At the very beginning, after the work of six days, the six days of creation, the Lord our God, we're told, rested, paused, looked at, reflected, and enjoyed what was good. And so this morning we come to our Lord Jesus standing on the hillside pointing to flowers. Flowers in the midst of the rocky terrain. Speaking, Jesus, now about lilies. They're definitely not the flora longiflorum that cultivated that we have around Easter in pots or even those that spring up from our gardens midsummer. These were wild lilies. Perhaps even we could say wild tulips. Lilies and tulips are of the same botanical family. Lilies, tulips, consider the lilies of the field, Jesus say, and how they grow. Jesus said, consider the lilies. Consider the tulips. Consider them, he said. He did not say, pick them. He said, look at them. Reflect upon them. As I pondered these words, I was at my desk Friday morning, upstairs in this tiny room that's barely wide enough for a single bed, but wide enough for my desk, therefore perfect for a study, and reading these words of our Lord over and over again, consider the lilies of the field. I felt moved to get up, to get up and go down and go out. And I sat on the deck by our back door. And there I considered the tulips and much else. I considered the seedlings that we'd started inside and now were being introduced to the sun outside. And I reflected upon how transitions may be sometimes of challenge, but they are good. I thought I considered the plum tree, the plum tree that we planted when we first moved into the house eight years ago. It provided greenery and privacy. But this year, for the first time, it's blossoming. And the tree is filled with blossoms. And I, I reflected upon the gift of patience and of anticipation. I considered the rhubarbs, the rhubarb leaves growing larger and larger, literally before my eyes, and the peony stalks growing taller and taller these days, and how they perhaps might point me to the taste and the, the color and the fragrances of the season about to come, and about life in all its promise still ahead. I think about the nasturtium seeds that still underground, buried under the leaves. They've been well watered, for sure, but are waiting for a bit of a, a warmer air. But they will germinate. And I've thought about how much life there is beneath the surface of what we see and even know. And looking at these plants, I considered so much more. So much more movement. There was the robin, bop, bop, bopping along, as Al Jolson would sing, and the blue jay, landing on the top of the fence, being gloriously showing its color. I considered the young rabbit, 
chewing away on the greenery, thankfully on the other side of the fence. And the worms, the worms that are brought up to the surface after the heavy rain, but are always at work aerating the soil for our good. I considered, yes, the vegetation. I considered the animals. And then I heard the noisy motorcycle turn the corner of our street. And, and I heard the conversations on the balcony next door. And I could even hear the children playing in the yard up the street. The point is that once I started considering life, once I started considering just one dimension of life, like considering the lilies, many other dimensions and layers of life are opened unto me, unto us. Georgiana O'Keeffe was an artist who now is acknowledged as the mother of American modernism. Wildly popular are her paintings these days. Her paintings of New York skyscrapers, of New Mexico scenery, but especially of flowers. Large-scale paintings of close-ups of flowers. Flowers like petunias and poppies and, yes, even tulips. O'Keefe once shared why she thought others might be attracted to her paintings of flowers. She wrote this. A flower is relatively small. Everyone has many associations with a flower, the idea of flowers. You can put out your hand to touch the flower. You can lean toward to smell it. Maybe touch it with your lips, almost without thinking. Or give it to someone to please them. Still, in a way, nobody sees a flower, really. It's so small. We haven't time. And it takes time, like it takes time to have a friend. And so I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me. But I'll paint it big, and they will be surprised into taking time to looking at it. I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. I appreciate this reminder about time and about the connections between seeing and being. To be still, to look, to consider. It is the time of an opening. It is a time often for revelation. Think about Moses in the wilderness. There was this bush. It was burning yet not consumed and he took time to consider it. Think how different his life, our life, would have been if he hadn't, if he just walked by. It's not always easy to carve out that energy or discipline to consider what is before our very eyes, but it is good. It changes lives, our lives, and that's not always easy, but it is good. Start with a couple square feet of the good earth beneath your feet. There where you stand or sit this very moment. And a whole world can unfold before you and around you. And you can see all the life, the life beyond you. It's humbling, but it's also filled with hope. We're reminded that we are not God but also that there is a God. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Consider the tulips of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, like even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
Your heavenly Father knows your need. Jesus is not suggesting that food and clothing are unimportant. It was Jesus himself who taught us to say, give us this day our daily bread. But he is saying there's more to life. Jesus is not denying, I think, the need for work or forethought. Think about the birds. Even the birds have to fly from branch to branch and tree to tree to seek out the seeds and fruit that they need. Even the birds have to build nests to provide for their family and migrate to warmer climes. Jesus is saying, however, that anxiety is unhelpful and it is unnecessary. We're not in this alone. It's not all on us. There is another who's at work for us and with us. He says that not only does anxiety rob us of life, for if the fear does not materialize, we will have worried over nothing. And if the fear does materialize perchance, well then we'll have worried and wasted energy twice, totally unnecessarily. But we of all people, Jesus says, we of all people know in Jesus himself that God cares for us and God does provide. Christians, like all others, experience trouble and suffering. Even pain, betrayal, and death, as did Jesus himself. But unlike others, Christians also can rest in the assurance that God is at work for good for those who love him. Assurance comes to us as we look around and consider, as we consider the abundance, the grace, the mystery of life, the good of life. And as we consider all that, we consider how Jesus lived, how he healed and taught, how he died and we were raised again for us and our salvation. And that assurance, and that assurance provides us, that assurance of God's steadfast love provides us with life, life in the midst of it all and through it all. It's an assurance that gives life. I know that many today are celebrating or being celebrated. It's Mother's Day. But for us, even more, it is Christian Family Sunday. Some might be waiting for a word or wanting a word, some word, any word about how to be a better parent or partner or sibling or child, but I'm afraid this is not the time for that word. My first word, in fact, my only word, is just look, consider. Look at those around you. Still yourself and be open to them. Open to their beauty, to their character, to their contradictions, to their gifts, to their prayers, to them. In the same way that we can be oblivious to all the world around us in a garden, so can we be oblivious to all the life in those who are right before us. Their hidden fears, their secrets, their hopes, and their talents, yet to be shared, yet to be known, yet to be addressed. Beatrice and I are currently watching a series on Netflix, it's called This Is Us. There are scenes of a contemporary life that are augmented by flashbacks. We're drawn into the lives of triplets and how those lives have evolved from infancy now into midlife. And now as adults, how they work to look at each other anew 
and work at accepting each other now as they are. This is us. A good part of human relationships that are life-giving and enjoyable is this sense, is this discipline of just seeing and acknowledging the other deeply, truly, fully, taking the time to consider the other, looking rather than eating. It's in exercising this discipline with others that we open ourselves up to fuller relationship with God. I began with Simone Weil, the French mystic of the 20th century. I conclude now with an English woman of the 14th century. She lived in a small, a tiny room that had just two tiny windows. One opened into the sanctuary of her town church through which she could receive communion and the other faced the street where, through which she could have conversations with townspeople as they came to her for spiritual advice. Well, over 30 times in her work, Revelations of Divine Love, she wrote about being, quote, enclosed. But it was in the context not of her small room being enclosed, but being enclosed in the context of God, who is always enclosing us, of Jesus, who wraps himself around us and does not let us go. She wrote, our Savior is our very mother, in whom we endlessly are born and never come out of him. She wrote about feeling safe, enclosed, embraced by God. This woman took the name of the saint after whom the church of her town was named. We know her now as Julian of Norwich. At age 30, she and everybody thought she was dying. As she received last rites, she also received two visions. The first was the face of her Lord, Jesus, and his great love for her. The second, was of her own hand. And in her hand, she held something small, no bigger than a hazelnut. She wrote, I looked at it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what can this be? I was amazed that it could last, for I thought that because of its littleness, it would suddenly have fallen into nothingness. And I was answered in my understanding. It lasts and always will because God loves it. And thus everything has being through the love of God. She held something small in her hand. And she held, she believed, all creation in her hand. After that, I'm sure that Julian of Norwich never looked again at anything small, anything at all the same. Considering the hazelnut, she learned about how her God considered her. Holding it, she learned how her God held her. And so my challenge is this week, Consider taking something small like a hazelnut in your hand and allow it to represent all that has been created. Consider it representing your own life or the life of someone you love. Consider giving thanks to God for making it and God loving it and God keeping it. Consider repeating the words to yourself, made, loved, kept, over and over again. And when other thoughts arise within you, don't fight them off, but just gently return to that small thing and to those words, made, loved, kept. And consider carrying that hazelnut with you through the day and even through the week. 
Simone Weil, George O'Keefe, Julian of Norwich, wonderful women, tulips, burning bush, hazelnuts, wonderful creation, and even more wonderful, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall wear. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Your heavenly Father knows your needs. Amen. I invite you to continue with me now as we proceed with our prayers of Thanksgiving intercession. Thanksgiving. They say that, well, we say that perhaps the deepest dimension of Christian faith is just gratitude. That life is, in fact, a response to grace and goodness. Gratitude. These days we acknowledge how many amongst us continue to to struggle, young families at home and work as well, those at work in contexts that, that are challenging, even, even dangerous in terms of health. But there's also gratitude, gratitude for, for example, the vaccines that 
we are knowing more and more. This past week, a member of our congregation shared with me a wonderful dimension of gratitude. She went with her husband to get their, their shots this week, and she had been looking forward to it and prepared even in advance a large poster card that she brought, that she delivered after her vaccination. And it was in the style of Cat in a Hat by... Here it is. I'm getting my vaccine today. Today I'm getting shot. Oh, what a joy to miss out on the sick I won't have got. Because I mask and wash my hands and space six feet away, I'm well enough to get my shot. Hooray, hooray, hooray. With my thanks, Rose. It's, it's good. It's wonderful. It's wonderful not only to be grateful to God, but to share our gratitude and to be grateful for God working through others. Even so, we, we lift up and acknowledge how this pandemic, how peoples around this world are struggling much more than we. We think, especially perhaps this morning, the peoples of India. And we think of the one quarter of this world that is dependent upon humanitarian aid in, in their need, whose lives have become even more fragile because of the pandemic's exacerbation of distribution and even of withdrawal of aid. But especially now this morning, we lift up our prayers, prayers of thanksgiving intercession for our families on this Christian Family Sunday. Let us pray. Some of us, O oh God, with busy homes and many people, and some of us in rooms quiet. Some of us with happy news to celebrate, and some of us with loss and a need to cry. All of us, O oh God, now are before you, seeking your presence in our lives and yearning to become your family of life and love. O oh God, you have joined all people of all generations as brothers and sisters in a common family. You are the heavenly parent of all humanity, and for this we are glad. We seek you because you first sought us. We love you because you first loved us. And we draw near to you now on behalf of our earthly families because you've drawn near to us in Jesus Christ and, and brought us into your heavenly family. We thank you, O oh God, for our families. And remember with gratitude all who by their love have taught us something of the meaning of membership in your family. Who, when anger and hardness of heart were justified, they responded with patience and generosity and forgiveness. They who took the risks and made the sacrifices that harmony and growth require. They who have at their best, best been not only good to us, but also for us. The faces of some of these dear ones, O oh God, we now see only in memory, and yet they still speak to us. They remind us of truths that we too seldom pursue, of values that we too often compromise, of people that we too rarely befriend, of a heritage that we too casually neglect. O oh God, in ways that they did ill, let us learn from the error of their ways, but in ways that they did well, let us perfect your good work that was begun in them, and so our lives might honor them and you. O oh God, we thank you for the pattern of family life that all of life is here with, from the salutation of birth to death's goodbye. God be with you. 
Oh God, we, we think of those who've made commitments of marriage to work to live together in truth, to share the hard times as well as the good times. Where there is despairing talk of separation, oh God, we pray for new understanding. And where their story together must come to an end, we pray, O oh God, let it be done with goodwill. We think of children, O oh God, and we pray that they may grow toward you as flowers to the sun. And where their homes bear the violence of word or deed, may they be strong beyond their years and know the peace of your love. We pray, O oh God, for brothers and sisters and relatives of all sorts. We pray that we may hold together as family and not spend precious years apart. Let old jealousies be forgotten, old hurts healed. Let new understandings be found. If we do not love those close to us, how can we talk of loving you? And, oh God, we think of other families around this world. Families of India, of Ethiopia and Syria. We think of isolated indigenous communities in our own land. We think of families fleeing, Lord, for their lives. Hear us, Lord, as we Lift up before you these families who are upon our hearts. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray in this time of silence. God, as we lift them up to you, we pray also for ourselves. We pray most of all that you might help us see that our own families, even our extended families, they are not ends in themselves, but they are always and must always bear the pain of rebirth into that greater family of heaven and earth by which you embrace all peoples. But we conclude now, Lord, by thanking you for our church family, for this congregation of St. Andrews, for our celebrations and struggles and even our sorrows. Bind us together, I pray, in Christ as your sons and daughters, brothers and sisters to all peoples of this world, and with his church around this world. We lift up our offerings and our tithes to you, O God, to support the work of our Lord through his church here and around the world. And just to say thank you. And just to say we trust you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you, world without end. In the name of Jesus, amen. singing of the love of God with a prayer that it might infuse and strengthen our loves. Love divine, all love is excelling.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace this day and your every day. Amen. Thank you.